Thank you very much, uh, Quentin, for your kind introduction. Let me fix this first. Um, so this is joint work with Melina Papuzzi at the ECB and Martin Schneider at Stanford. Um, in the current low interest rate environment, uh, the main tool for central bank has been unconventional monetary policy. So central banks have been buying assets. Uh, they've been buying government bonds traditionally, uh, but more recently they've also been buying mortgage-backed securities, other assets, uh, and now corporate bonds. And so the goal of these actions is to lower firms' cost of capital and stimulate investment. Uh, and so that raises the question, uh, which corporate bonds uh, should central banks buy? The conventional view on this is that monetary policy should aim for market neutrality. Uh, so there, the reason is that central banks don't have a mandate to favor particular firms with their monetary policy. So for example, there's no mandate uh, to favor green investment. Uh, and so central banks have been trying to conduct monetary policy in a way that is neutral towards the market. Uh, and in practice, this has meant that central banks have been buying bonds proportional to the amount of uh, bonds outstanding. In this paper, we ask, uh, what are market neutral asset purchases? So if you had to uh, answer the question to a central bank, uh, what should they do if they actually wanted to be market neutral? What should they be, be buying? Uh, and in particular, is what the ECB currently doing? Is that market neutral? Another question that arises in this context is what is optimal? What should they be buying just from an optimal perspective uh, in a world where you have financial frictions and climate externalities? So these are the questions that we're trying to address in this paper. First, we look at data. We wanna know what is the ECB currently doing? Uh, and so here we measure ECB holdings. Uh, we measure the amount of securities outstanding uh, of different corporations. And then we measure emissions by sector. And then we benchmark these holdings of the ECB with the market portfolio. So this is basically the market portfolio firm value. Think of this as equity plus debt. Uh, so total firm value. And so that is a measure of uh, capital shares by sector. And so you can compare what the ECB is holding to what the market look, looks like. And so here we find that the ECB portfolio looks like sector shares of emissions. Uh, it doesn't look like the market portfolio. And in particular, the ECB overweighs dirty industries relative to the market portfolio. The portfolio composition of the ECB reflects its implementation of market neutrality. It's because the ECB buys proportional to bonds outstanding. Um, it ends up with a portfolio that looks dirtier. And the reason is that dirty sectors uh, issue relatively more bonds. Uh, and so the question arises is, uh, are these dirty asset purchases market neutral? Uh, are they optimal? Is this what the ECB should be doing? or should these purchases be greener? And so for that, we need a model. We need a model to answer the question of what is neutral and what's optimal. And so there we write down a growth model with heterogeneous firms. Uh, the model has climate externalities and financial frictions. And so here in this model, firms differ by how risky they are and by how much uh, they emit, so their emission intensity. And then asset purchases uh, by central banks work through return premia. They, uh, the effect of these purchases differ across firms. There is first a direct effect of asset purchases, which is to lower the cost of capital uh, of firms. And there's also an indirect effect, uh, which is that the purchase program creates more safe government debt um, because you are buying all these corporate bonds and you somehow have to finance these purchases. So you create more uh, safe government debt, in particular more reserves. Uh, that lowers return premium for many assets uh, and that, that channel benefits risky firms more. So this is a general equilibrium effect, which is indirect because it's lowering return premium on lots of different assets. In this framework, you can think of 
what, it, what would be a market neutral policy? So if you had to tell central banks what they should be doing to be market neutral, is you would say, uh, you conduct your policy in a way that leaves relative cost of capital unchanged. Um, so that would be market neutral. Um, it only, you can only have with your policy macro effects. So you can lower, let's say, uh, the cost of capital for everyone in the same way, but you're not distorting the market portfolio. And so these purchases would have to underweigh risky farms to offset the GE effect that benefits mostly risky farms. In this sense, the current ECB portfolio is not neutral because uh, it favors dirty firms that we know are more risky because there's uh, a lot of empirical work that documents pollution premia. The fact that firms that have uh, higher emissions uh, have to pay higher returns uh, to their investors. And so the uh, a market neutral policy would undo uh, this GE effect and underway risky firms, uh, what would the optimal monetary policy do? Well, optimal policy, if you put a planner into this model, what the planner would do is design a carbon tax and also design an asset purchase program where the asset purchase program would address financial frictions. And then, so it would favor risky firms, the financial frictions are uh, strongest for them, uh, it raises their cost of capital the most. Uh, and so you would um, address with your asset purchase program, uh, these financial frictions for risky firms. And so that would favor risky firms. Uh, and so the question then becomes, uh, what would you do in the current world where we don't have a carbon tax? Um, then it may be actually be beneficial to favor green firms because that's a channel through which you can address uh, these climate externalities. Let me first show you what the ECB is currently doing in the data. So what we do is we measure the ECB portfolio uh, by sector. So we start with the ECB security holding statistics on purchases of individual bonds. So this is uh, uh, confidential data on ECB holdings. Uh, and we merge these holdings uh, to the ECB centralized security database on uh, bonds outstanding of different firms. How many bonds do they have uh, outstanding in Europe? Uh, and so what's really important in this work uh, is to take care of special purpose entities. Um, so if you look at the raw data on ECB holdings, you will find that bonds by firms in the finance sector are the vast majority of ECB holdings. So they are 56% uh, of the ECB portfolio is just companies in the finance sector. Uh, and you know that that can't be true because these firms are ineligible for the corporate bond purchase program. Uh, so you know something is wrong if you just look at the raw data. Uh, and so how is this possible that the ECB portfolio is made out of many holdings in the finance sector? The reason is that the ECB buys bonds from companies, for example, like Royal Dutch Shell, which is an oil manufacturer. And when uh, Royal Dutch Shell uh, issues bonds, they're issued through Shell International Finance BD, which is a finance company. It belongs to the finance. If you look up in Bloomberg, which sector this company belongs to, it belongs to the finance sector. Uh, and so it issues the bonds for Royal Dutch Shell. And so what you have to do in order to attribute ECB holdings to various sectors in the economy is you have to research every single uh, special purpose entity and attribute the bonds to the right sector. Uh, and if you do that, you reduce bonds from the finance sector uh, to 11%. You can't go much further than that because there is a number of uh, financial companies that, that issue for many different companies. And so it's difficult to attribute these bonds to a particular sector. So from now on, I'm just going to leave out these 11% and I'm going to show you results for the non-financial sector only. In the paper, we look at three different measures of the market portfolio by sector. Uh, one is capital income. Um, so that's one measure of how big a sector is relative to others. Another is book assets from Orbis. Uh, and a third is um, ideally you would want the market value of firms in each sector. So this is market value of equity plus market value of bonds. Uh, but you can only do this for public companies in Orbis. Uh, so that's our third measure, is you take all the public companies in a sector and you measure their market value. Fortunately, 
no matter what uh, measure of the market portfolio you use, you end up with the same result. So here in the talk, I'm only going to sh show you capital income, uh, but in the paper, you see all three measures and they basically give you the same results. So here is market shares by sector. So on the horizontal axis, you see shares uh, of, the, uh, of the sectors. Uh, in total, and you see on the uh, vertical axis, the various sectors, agriculture, automobile sector, then there's a large manufacturing sector that we split up uh, into what we call dirty manufacturing, which are subsectors of manufacturing that have very high emissions. This is oil and coke, chemicals, basic metals, and non-metallic minerals. And then we have other manufacturing. So these are the other subsectors in manufacturing. Then we have utilities, transportation, and services. And so what you see is that these, so these red bars are the market shares. Uh, and so what you see is that the European economy is an advanced economy in which the service sector is the largest sector of the economy and the other sectors are smaller, like agriculture and automobiles. Now I can show you the ECB portfolio. That's the, the blue bars. Uh, this is what the ECB holds of the various sectors. And so what you see is that the ECB uh, doesn't hold uh, agricultural bonds. It holds more automobiles uh, and then even more dirty manufacturing bonds, uh, utilities, transportation, other manufacturing. And then it doesn't hold a lot of service bonds. Uh, so bonds issued by the service sector. Let me compare these. Uh, red bars, the market portfolio, and the blue, which is the ECB, what the ECB holds, with emissions. Uh, so these are direct emissions of each sector. Um, so these are carbon emissions uh, of the various sectors in gray. And so what you see is that what the ECB does uh, in its portfolio, it's overweighing sectors that have relatively more emissions like dirty manufacturing, utilities, transportation, and other manufacturing, and it's underweighing services, which is a relatively clean sector, uh, but the ECB doesn't hold many bonds uh, of the service sector. Okay, so this is the, basically the main result, and you can do this in different ways of constructing uh, the, these market shares, the red bars, uh, the, the the result is always the same, uh, that the ECB overweighs dirty manufacturing, utilities and transportation and underweighs services. Uh, and so the ECB portfolio looks more like sector shares of emissions and it doesn't look like the market portfolio. And the uh, reason, so if you ask why would the ECB buy a portfolio that looks more like emissions instead of the market portfolio is because the ECB buys proportionately to bonds outstanding. That's their way of implementing uh, their goal of being market neutral. Uh, and the, uh, it's not due to eligibility criteria. Uh, it's really due to just buying proportionally. So let me show you uh, how this works. Here in this graph, you have again uh, shares. The red is market shares of the various sector in total. And then the darker rent is how many bonds there are of each sector, uh, how many bonds outstanding. Uh, and so what you see is that um, dirty manufacturing, utilities, and transportation, they just have more bonds outstanding uh, than the service sector. So if your, your eye now compares the blue ECB holdings with uh, the darker red lines, basically what the ECB is doing is it's buying proportionately two bonds outstanding. And so if you look at the purple uh, bar, that's how many bonds there are eligible of each sector uh, for the ECB to buy. And so what you see is that eligibility is not the problem. Uh, the ECB is just buying what's out there uh, in terms of bonds. Uh, and that what makes it end up with a dirty portfolio. And so the, that raises the question is, if you had to tell central banks what, bo what bonds to buy, uh, what would you say? What should they be buying in order for them to stay market neutral? And so here is a model to think about this question and also to think about what's optimal for central banks to do. And so this is a growth model with climate externalities and financial frictions. Uh, so there's a representative agent with preferences over a final consumption good C that inelastically supplies one unit of labor. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, this final good that the that households are consuming is made out of N intermediate goods. These are the little YNs. They're produced by, by different farms. Uh, and so here you see a Cobb Douglas aggregate that makes the final good out of these N intermediate goods. And the intermediate goods are produced by different farms. Uh, and these different farms, they experience climate externalities in production. Um, so the way we capture this is we say uh, they have TFP, um, they have productivity in their uh, production function, which depends on a climate index, uh, which let's, let's call it temperature, uh, ADA. And so temperature, ADA, it's what is what summarizes the quality of the environment. Uh, and so this is much like an integrated assessment models by Nordhaus, there's an index uh, that describes how the environment is doing. That's our ADA. And then production um, by these farms increases temperature because you have um, emission intensities, ADA, epsilon, these epsilons, they multiply how much each farm is producing. And so the cumulative um, amount of emissions is what raises temperature. And so what you see here is this unit root dynamics of uh, temperature. Temperature is today is temperature yesterday plus new emissions. Uh, and so this is how pro production raises emissions and then raises temperature. And that's bad for productivity, uh, Z. Z. Okay, so, so we have these climate externalities. Uh, and on top of that, we need financial frictions to be thinking about uh, quantitative easing or, or corporate bond purchase programs. And so here we're saying there are two technologies for households to hold capital firms. Uh, there are holdings of capital through a public technology, so that's the K-Wiggle. And there's also holdings of capital through a private technology, that's K. Both technologies come with balance sheet costs. Uh, so they, are, they involve costs, uh, which we describe with cost functions, H, Wiggle, and H. These are just resource costs in terms of the final good. They're increasing in how much capital households are holding. They're quasi-convex, which captures a notion of diversification benefits, and they're homogeneous of degree one. So the more capital you hold, the, the higher are these balance sheet costs. And these private holding costs, uh, the H, also depends on holdings of government debt, DT. And so what's the interpretation of these balance sheet costs? Uh, they capture that risky investments are costly. Some of them don't pan out. Uh, in that case, resources are gone. Holding more capital is riskier. It's associated with more costs. And overall risk depends also on holdings of safe government debt, DT. So this is what, the, these are our financial frictions. And so how do they show up uh, in how this uh, production technology is decentralized? So you have private intermediaries they invest in capital using a private technology uh, or government bonds. They're owned by households. So these are not agents, they're corporations. They are competitive firms that are owned by households and they maximize shareholder value. So they uh, buy capital and government bonds, DT, uh, capital in the various sectors, then they get returns on these investments. Um, so return on capital and returns on government bonds but they also face these balance sheet costs, H. And so how do their optimization first order conditions look like? Uh, the first order conditions say uh, the, uh, the return on capital in sector uh, N or in firm N is uh, weighted by the pricing kernel of households because these are the shareholders of these private intermediaries. Uh, and that's equal to one plus uh, the marginal holding costs of uh, capital in sector N or in firm N. Uh, and so you see this marginal uh, holding cost on the right-hand side here. It's the derivative of the H function with respect to capital in sector N uh, or in firm N. Uh, and so this is literally a, a derivative of capital holding. So imagine K is a whole vector of capital in the various farms. Uh, and so here you're looking at the derivative of costs with respect to holding more capital uh, in farm N. And so this is a return premium over the short rate. How do you see that? It's because if you look at the 
the Euler equation that households are um, have for safe investments, that's the RS, that's the short rate, that is just your typical Euler equation that's equal to one is pricing kernel times the short rate is equal to one, where the pricing kernel is just the marginal rate of substitution between today and tomorrow. Then you see that this marginal holding cost is literally the return premium over the risk free rate. So this is a financial friction. Uh, and so that firm space, so what do firms do? So they produce intermediate goods. They issue claims to capital income. They pay a cost of capital, RN. They hire labor uh, at a wage W. They sell goods at prices, PN in competitive markets. Uh, and they uh, pay a carbon tax tau. If the, if the government imposes a carbon tax, they have to pay a, a tax tau per unit of emissions. And so they maximize profits. And so how do profits look like? It's revenues minus the carbon tax uh, minus what they pay for inputs and what they pay for inputs is labor costs and then the, the, the cost of capital. And so what you see here is that uh, this RN affects how costly it is for these firms to hold capital. And the final good firms, they just buy intermediate goods at price PN and then they sell the final good at price one. And so what, how do these uh, first order conditions for these firms look like, these intermediate good firms? It looks standard, it's basically marginal product of capital uh, minus the carbon tax, which is equal to the cost of capital. But now we know that because the intermediaries hold the capital, uh, that contains this return premium. And so what firms face is a cost of capital that contains this return premium. And so what, how does the equilibrium look like? The government picks asset holdings, uh, K-Wiggle, it issues that, um, so this is the sum of all, all capital holdings that the government holds, uh, that's equal to debt by the government, and then it satisfies a government budget constraint. So the government essentially uh, buys capital in the various farms, uh, it issues debt, uh, it has to pay uh, interest on debt holdings, then it raises this car uh, the, the carbon tax, tau, and so to the extent that the government makes money by getting returns on uh, asset holdings and the carbon tax, it just rebates them to a household lump sum. So this is basically a version of the Baker Schultz plan is do a carbon tax and just revert it back lump sum to households. And then agents optimize and make it clear. So in, in the following, it's gonna be useful to think of shares uh, here. Everything here in this model is gonna be constant uh, returns to scale that these firms and intermediaries do. So it's, it's good to think about what is the share of each firm in the total capital stock uh, KT. So that's my kappa. These are the capital shares. Um, and the, so basically, basically, this is the, the analog of what I was showing you earlier, the red bars. Uh, these are the market shares. It's the total claim to capital. It's the market value of the firm. And then the central bank holds shares of capital, uh, that's the kappa wiggle, uh, and it does that with a debt share, which is total government debt, DT, over the capital stock. And the private intermediaries just hold the rest. So they hold the capital shares minus what the government holds. So let me first think about a frictionless world. So what if there were no financial frictions? What would happen in this model? Uh, in this model, uh, basically, firms would equate the marginal product of their capital to the cost of capital, uh, and that would be equal to the safe rate. Uh, no financial frictions, there are no return premium. Uh, and so what the market portfolio, what these kappas solve, is they just equate marginal products across firms. And so what you see is if the right-hand side is the same for all firms, on the left-hand side, uh, what the market share solves is just it's just reflecting technology and preferences. So the alphas and the gamma, the, the gammas, which are just technology parameters, that's what they reflect. Uh, and so in this frictionless world, Modigliani, Miller, and Ricardian equivalents hold. Uh, so here, uh, asset purchases are irrelevant for investment and the climate uh, because um, the, whatever the government does is undone by the private sector. You get the same market shares kappa. And so here, let me say that you, you read on the blogosphere uh, by economists uh, that 
uh, financial frictions don't matter. So many economists think that financial frictions don't exist, uh, and so they don't matter. Uh, but it's really important that central banks be market neutral. Uh, and so these two views in the setup don't make any sense together because in a frictionless world, it doesn't really matter what central banks are doing. Uh, they can buy whatever they want uh, and the, you get the same market shares kappa because the kappas, they just reflect technology and preferences. So you, you can't have these two views uh, in the same person. Um, so let me now show you the equilibrium uh, with financial friction. So with financial frictions, the marginal product of capital gets equated to the cost of capital. Uh, and so that reflects marginal holding costs. So now the market portfolio reflects these holding costs and firms with higher marginal holding costs. So firms that have a higher right-hand side here, uh, they pay a higher premium over the short rate. They do less investment. So you see the kappa of these firms, which is in the denominator, is lower if they have higher marginal holding costs. Uh, and now you see that because of the, the properties of H that I assumed earlier, I can write this not just in capital holdings and holdings of government debt, but in terms of shares. So this is how much capital the intermediaries hold. It's kappa minus kappa wiggle times delta. It's how much uh, capital uh, intermediaries hold of each firm. Uh, and how much government debt they hold. And so by changing government policy, you directly affect marginal costs and therefore financial frictions. And so how would this look like? How could you direct capital into a specific firm or a sector? Is basically look at the left-hand side, which equates uh, the demand, basically it's a measure of the demand for capital, which is inverse to the cost of capital. So you demand more capital if your cost is lower. And on the right-hand side, you have the supply of capital. This is what intermediaries are supplying. And so you can think of this as just in a simple demand and supply diagram. On the horizontal axis, you have the capital share of a firm uh, in the economy. On the vertical axis, you have the cost of capital. Uh, and so you start from an original equilibrium where you have some supply, uh, which is the right-hand side of this equation uh, and the demand. And now the government can increase its weight uh, on a particular firm, Kappa Wiggle N. Uh, so it increases the weight on, on a particular firm and it lowers some other capital weights on other firms. And I'm doing a policy that keeps the total amount of government debt unchanged. And so by doing that, what you do is you increase the supply of capital for this firm, and that increases the capital share of that firm and it lowers their return. And so in this framework now, government policy is not neutral, is not, um, is not necessarily neutral. It can affect the allocation of capital uh, to a firm or a sector. And so the question is, how would you do this in a way that is market neutral? And so let me first comment, uh, make a bunch of comments on the setup that I just showed you. So one is about the role of the central bank. So this, I, what I showed you is a real model uh, where we focus on how central bank policy affects risk premium and investment. Uh, it's not about price stability. Uh, that's because we've done earlier work where uh, we saw that with flexible prices, you get similar effects in a nominal model. Uh, so not much changes if you uh, study a nominal version of this setup. And also because investment is about the medium run. Uh, so we've seen a decade of large central bank balance sheet. And so to think about investment, uh, we really have to think about the medium run, how these lower returns that we get from uh, central bank interventions affect investment uh, over the medium run. Uh, and so at, that, at these frequencies, price uh, stickiness is not, no longer the relevant friction. So you're really thinking about a world with flexible prices. And so this is what I've shown you. In terms of these balance sheet costs, uh, the setup captures the familiar theme from the literature, which is QE stimulates the economy when the government is better able to commit to repay uh, than the private sector. And so this is a theme that uh, is reflected in a lot of work, uh, of including people who are uh, in the audience uh, where this is going on is the, the government does QE uh, and then uh, affects investment through balance sheets of intermediaries. The new element here is that you have heterogeneous farms. Uh, 
And so these farms have different frictions that are described by these holding costs. And so firm level risk premia are affected. And so we need to know how uh, purchases of, of corporate bonds, but also conventional uh, policy, how that affects these risk premia that firms face and they face different premia. We have an extension of the setup to endogenous firm leverage. Um, so here uh, in the setup that I shown you, the central bank buys claims to capital, but our new version of the setup has the central bank only buying bonds, not equity. Uh, and that has effects on liquidity and risk premia. Uh, so if you check my website in two weeks, you're gonna see this new version of the model with, uh, with endogenous firm leverage, um, but it essentially works exactly the same way. Um, here, there's an interaction uh, between climate externalities and financial friction. So you would think the evidence that we have about pollu pollution premia, you would think that the, the parameters of this holding cost function H will vary with emission intensities epsilon. Uh, and so the, 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 two fric the, the, the two features of this model are not independent. Uh, firms with higher emission intensities face stronger frictions. And so how would you think about market neutral, a market neutral policy? In this setup, quite naturally, you would say, uh, if, if you had to tell a central bank how to be market neutral, you would tell them, just leave relative returns unchanged. So how the return on cap, the, the cost of capital of one firm N to the other firm M, that ratio has to stay unchanged. And so if you start from a laissez-faire equilibrium with no government intervention, uh, then you do a comparative study to an equilibrium with the government, uh, then market neutral uh, means you get the same market portfolio kappa in the new equilibrium uh, with, the, with the policy. And so the question then is, what do you have to do in order to get the uh, same market portfolio, um, kappa? You can already see if H, the holding cost function, is separable in capital and government debt, uh, then a neutral policy would be to buy proportional to the market shares uh, of the various companies. So your ECB portfolio would reflect market share, but not bond market shares, but total market shares. Okay, so that would be market neutral. Uh, so this is a very special financial system in which government debt doesn't lower risk premium. Uh, so this is not the type of model that most of us would think is relevant for unconventional monetary policy. Uh, the more relevant uh, model has market uh, neutral policies that don't look like the market portfolio. The reason is because any purchase lowers risk premium and that benefits risky firms the most. Uh, so if you, be, if you want to be market neutral, you would have to tell central banks to underweigh risky firms because there's this general equilibrium effect that will lower risk premia for all firms. Uh, and so you have to underweigh risky firms to offset this beneficial GE effect. What would be optimal? Optimal is to choose a carbon tax and an asset purchase program. Uh, the purchase program would be independent of uh, the climate externality. Uh, you would take the carbon tax to fix the cli climate externality. So this is the principle of targeting in public finance. You use the, the policy that fixes this most directly, which is the carbon tax. And then the asset purchase program just thinks about financial frictions. And so what is the equation that a planner would have in mind? The planner would equate marginal private holding costs uh, of cap firm capital to the government holding costs plus the effect of doing a purchase program on intermediaries. So that's this term in green on the right hand side. That's just the effect of uh, doing the policy and thereby affecting the portfolio of private intermediaries, which then affects their risk premium. And so the optimal policy equates these all. And so the, how this exactly looks like depends on these holding costs. Uh, if, for example, the government has the same holding costs across different sectors. What the government would do is equate all financial frictions across different firms, and that would lower premium for risky sectors the most. And so in this sense, optimal policy would not be neutral because you would be fixing the financial frictions where they are the strongest. Um, and so to be for this policy, for an optimal policy to be neutral, uh, that is really a knife edge condition, um, which is unlikely that, we'll, that this is going on in practice. So let me summarize what I 
what I have shown you. I've shown you empirical evidence that the ECB portfolio looks like the sector shares of a mission. It doesn't look like uh, the market portfolio. The ECB overweighs dirty sectors um, relative to their market shares. In terms of thinking about market neutrality, you would naturally define it as uh, not changing the relative cost of capital. Otherwise, you destroyed the market portfolio. Uh, and holding bonds in, proportional, in proportion to the amount of bonds outstanding is not a simple recipe uh, for having neutrality. And instead, the ECB uh, currently favors risky and bond levered firms. So firms that have a lot of emissions, uh, have pollution premia in that sense, they are very risky. Uh, they also have a lot of tangible assets so they can issue a lot of bonds. Uh, and that's why the ECB buys a lot of them. Uh, with the carbon tax, uh, up, what's optimal would be to address financial frictions. And so here you would uh, favor risky firms because they are mostly affected by the financial frictions. But uh, we don't have a carbon tax. Uh, and so then you can think of um, investment, directing investment uh, towards greener companies. And that would be from the point of view of this model beneficial is um, having a greener uh, monetary policy. Thank you, Monica. That's very insightful, a lot of food for thought. Um, so I think we can open up for questions. So I would also would like to remind that anyone can ask questions, not only from panelists, but also the attendees. So uh, I think George was first. It was very close, but um, please go ahead. Yes, thanks. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed and was impressed by this uh, uh, paper, Monica. I, I didn't know how you were going to square the circle, starting with the difference between the in sector shares uh, and uh, the ECB portfolio uh, shares and your theory, but somehow you more or less did. <laughs> but, uh, but that raised a question in my mind. Um, if, if I understand correctly, it would be approximately optimal, or wouldn't it, for the ECB's bond portfolio to actually reflect the shares in that portfolio, portfolio to actually reflect the sizes of the different sectors or the shares of those sectors of total of the total market? Is that is that not correct, uh, or do you have any sense of? how reasonable an approximation it might be? So the, um, it, would not be, it would not be neutral and not be optimal. And so this is what uh, we, we think is interesting is that if you just ask yourself the simple question, uh, what would you tell the ECB that they should be doing to be market neutral? It's not to buy the market portfolio. So it would not look like the market. And so why not? It's because of this indirect effect on risk premium. So whenever central banks conduct monetary policy, and this is uh, in the context of this corporate bond purchase program, but much more generally, any monetary policy affects risk premium. And because some firms have higher risk premium than others, any policy will might affect firms differently. And so you're gonna do favor, favoritism. Um, and so this is what, we're trying to point out with this paper is you have to look exactly at which firms you're favoring by doing your policy. Uh, and because risk premia are the largest for the, uh, or financial frictions are the strongest for riskier firms, what you would have to do to be market neutral is to buy less of risky firms. Uh, and so it's, it would not look like the market portfolio, uh, which is something that you would think, but you would underweigh these risky firms. The only uh, world in which uh, buying the market portfolio would be neutral is if uh, the, uh, the investors who hold claims to firms do not hold uh, government bonds. So if those two markets are totally segmented, then there is no way of your corporate bond purchase program to affect risk premium uh, more generally. Uh, but if you do, which is the world that most of us think about is that central banks come in and they lower risk premium. In such a world, you would not buy the market portfolio because you're benefiting uh, disproportionately risky firms. Uh, 
I mean, just uh, for clarification, Monica, my my uh, I understand that the market portfolio is not right, and that's what the ECB is buying now, right? Or more or less, bond market, yes, the bond market bond portfolios. Market. But yes. you're saying it, you're saying it wouldn't even represent uh, the uh, it wouldn't look much like the shares of the different sectors as uh, no, uh, yes. as a exactly. portion of the whole economy. Exactly. So on your bar exactly. chart, you would have yet another set of bars that are the optimal uh, allocation, yes. and that's what I'm curious about whether they would look whether that would be even smaller, for example, for the dirty industries. Yes. Than, yes. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Even exactly. Your intuition is exactly share. right. It would do it. It would hold a lot more bonds in the service sector uh, because okay. that's a sector that is relatively safe. Uh, and has uh, in, ter in terms of not having pollution premia, and so you you would over you would put a higher weight on the service sector exactly, uh, okay. and so it's an in, it's a very interesting question is to ask how exactly what is what are the numbers that you would tell the ECB mm -hmm. right now we can only say just qualitatively it goes the other way uh, other way what they're I currently doing is totally uh, wrong they would have to go the other way exactly it's your intuition. It would actually be quite interesting to use your framework to get a quantification here, I guess. Yeah. So, so we, we are actually running out of time, but I certainly don't want to cut short the discussion. So we are officially starting the five minute break, but maybe uh, St Stefan can ask uh, his question. And then there's another question from uh, Win Monroe uh, from the attendee. So let's, let's try to squeeze these two in the five minutes now. I just said, you know, so I, I... I guess the what's going on is that you've got uh, you've got this world where just so we got we've got the private sector with these balance sheet costs, and I guess the looks like the the uh, the government doesn't doesn't have balance sheet costs, and then we're kind of balancing that against uh, against uh, you know these externalities in different in different in different sectors. So it does. So, so the, the the government does have its own balance sheet cost that was the H wiggle yeah, so, yeah. so everything so I'm not saying it's free for central banks uh, to buy right. these assets I'm not, I'm not not at all saying that and so I, okay. I think this is where you're so, coming from yeah, so so you're thinking of this kind of well if you're a central bank and if, if you're going to do this you know if you're going to have this policy how well, what's the best way to do it exactly and of course you know there are all these other issues to do that you know that people worry about. And, well, I mean, one would be, I guess, that you know, somebody may might take a best position that well, I don't know that, you know that these asset purchases don't matter that much, and and they're therefore this you know here's the central bank trying to trying to do something and it'll have little effect, or or else exactly. the, the other the other position might be that oh that it has a big effect, but now this. This uh, introduces all these political economy issues. Exactly. And people want to, you know, people start lobbying the central bank, you know, to to you know favor favor their sector for whatever for whatever reason. Yeah. Exactly. So so what I, I'm exactly with you. I'm I we're not taking a stance as to whether these effects are big or small. We're just saying if you don't believe in in these effects, if you think that central banks have no effect then it doesn't really matter what they're buying because it doesn't have an effect anyway. So let them buy whatever they want to buy. It doesn't matter. But if it does have an effect, uh, and I haven't quite made up my own mind about this, of whether how big these effects are, but if they have an effect, uh, then we really have to pay attention uh, to what they're buying because then they're, they're favoring certain firms over others. And then we have to be very careful as to whether they are basically financing the wrong firms. So right, and so this was the point of the empirical exercises. We wanted to know whom are they currently favoring? They have a huge portfolio. The ECB has a huge corporate bond portfolio. They are now the largest investor in new bond issuance uh, of these corporations. So, that, so they're big, they're a big player. And so the question is, if it does matter what they're doing, whom are they currently favoring? Uh, and so that picture is basically clear. Is there, they're favoring, you want the wrong firms. Uh. So Win Monroe had the last question, but we only have two minutes. So if you can make it quick, it would be wonderful. Sure, can you hear me? Yes. 
Um, so I, I guess the, this idea of kind of um, risk neutrality in asset purchases, I think is particularly interesting. And I was just trying to think a little bit more about what some of the kind of side effects might be if we start thinking about uh, kind of risk neutrality from a broader perspective than just environmental risk. And so, you know, for example, we think quantitative easing lowers uh, risk premia for risky firms that, you know, prevents them from going into bankruptcy and, um, you know, perhaps this kind of helping risky firms independent of the kind of carbon risk dimension, maybe that's an important part of the efficacy of monetary policy. And so how might we trade, um, trade this off um, in terms of kind of broader risk and policy efficacy versus kind of carbon risk more specifically? Yes, exactly. So you would have to take a stance, a quantitative uh, stance as to how large the climate component of the risk is, as opposed to other uh, types of risk. Uh, and they are exactly, you have inefficiencies coming from bankruptcies. And so the central bank can play uh, an important role and has been playing in Europe, an important role in uh, trying to minimize um, these financial frictions, let me broadly speaking, that have to do with risk in the financial system. And so by, with interventions, you can, this is a framework that uh, even if you take out the climate externalities, uh, for, for me, this is a framework to think about which firms um, monetary policy are affecting. And so just as we think about uh, monetary policy affecting different households differently, I want to think about how does monetary policy affect different firms uh, in the, and some of them have more bankruptcy risk and therefore face more deadweight costs in bankruptcy. And so the central bank can play uh, a role uh, in this. And so the, the framework helps you think about exactly these trade-offs uh, and helps you think about what's optimal and what's neutral in such a world. Great, thanks. Thank you, Monica. So there were two other questions that we don't we won't have the time to address now. So maybe hopefully we, we, we can do it. So at the end of this uh, day, we'll have a bit of time uh, to prolong the discussion potentially. I don't know if Monica will be here, but some, some will definitely. So uh, feel free to join us at this point in time. So now we are going to move to the uh, panel session and I let Isabella take over.